circulation in his legs and feet. Bob Johnson is recovering from a stroke in Eagle Point. <coughs> Carolyn Snyder's biopsy uh, report came back positive for cancer. She goes to see her doctor Monday and then we'll go see a surgeon. Uh, Evelyn Duckworth is struggling with COVID. They put a trach and feeding tube in this week and she will be transferred transferred to Newark, Ohio. Is that right? Okay. <clears throat> Rhonda's sister-in-law, Cindy, is in Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville in critical condition. They've been able to get her blood pressure and her heart rate leveled out. She's doing a little bit better. Karen Metz has a hiatal hernia. and We'll see the doctor soon for a treatment plan. Larry Shears, uh, is resting at home from a heart attack. He was able to be here this morning. We're glad to see him. Paul Lemon has leukemia and they're going to do a bone marrow test in about a week. And Linda Nixon uh, is having eye problems. Her visual gel is separating from her retina. Let's remember all these folks in our prayers. There will be a preacher and elders meeting tomorrow evening at 6.30. If you have something that you'd like to have brought up in that meeting, please bring it either to Elvis or one of the elders. Saturday, April 17th, 2021 will be a ladies' day uh, at Barlow Vincent Church of Christ. Sign on the bulletin board back there says that you need to pre register. Uh, you do not, they'll still let you come if you just show up. April 24th, be the men's breakfast at Cheryl's Country Diner at 9. Tuesday, April 27th, will be Ladies Digging Deep podcast online. And Friday, April 30th, we will be having game night in the fellowship ring downstairs. Don't forget the youth rally, May 7th and 8th. 
Is there anything else that needs to be announced this evening? Tyler had to work this evening, so I'm going to fill in for him. First song will be number 42. I've reached the land of lovely brown and all its riches freely brown. Here shines a dear one blissful day for all my night has passed away. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah. turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has come, become evident to the whole palace guard 
and to the and all the rest about my change of my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident in about my chains, are much more bold to speak of the to speak the word without fear. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening in prayer, Father. Thank you, Father, for another day. And we pray, Father, that uh, as we uh, enter into this Bible, uh, into this worship service this evening, Father, that you would uh, help Elvis to have a ready remembrance of the words he wants to speak, Father. Uh, we pray, Father, that everyone here will be able to uh, learn a portion of uh, your word this evening and we also pray that the songs that we sing tonight father will be pleasing unto you and our worship to you be pleasing to you this evening we pray father for all those who are mentioned who are sick that you would uh, be with them and be with their doctors and if it be your will father that you'd bring them back to health we also pray, Father, for all those who are struggling with all different sorts of issues in their life, whether it be uh, loss of, uh, struggling with loss of loved ones or uh, different kinds of addictions, Father, or sin in their life. We just pray for those people. And we pray, Father, you would forgive us each for where we sinned against you. We pray also, Father, for our elected officials in this country that they could look to you for uh, guidance and and the, and the people of our country that uh, that they may repent, Father, and turn to you and and each of each people's lives in this country, Father, and that you could thank you for blessing our country as you have over the last two hundred and some years. We just pray, Father, that uh, if it be your will, you could continue blessing us and, and thank you for all these blessings. Father, we pray all these things through your Son Jesus' holy name. Amen. Six hundred fifty seven. When with the Savior we enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful? What a day of rejoicing at the meeting. 
will be number 226 if you'd like to mark your book. Good evening. Good evening. It is good to see you tonight. Hopefully you had a wonderful afternoon. I was told by several people that I need to keep them awake tonight because they ate too much this afternoon. So, But it's good to be here tonight, Lord's Day. We're looking at the book of Philippians, one of the most exciting books of the Bible, if you will, one of the most exciting letters, if you will, written by Paul. And when we look at Paul, I want us to kind of think about this as the way Paul would kind of think about it. And one of the key verses of chapter one is verse 12, which we'll look at in just a few moments. It's on the board. I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out. You know, when we think about life, it's not always great news. It's not always good circumstances. It's not always going our way. For a matter of fact, and, and I was thinking about this lesson, I thought, you know, this the last year has been a little rough on people, hasn't it? Things have kind of gotten off kilter and, and, and spiritually the church as a whole um, has suffered. And, and I say that because I saw an article just recently and, and every church is saying this, that, that because of the COVID virus, their attendance is down uh, 50% plus. And we see that here and ours is beginning to go back up as people get their, their vaccinations and different things and the, the numbers seem to be dropping and we're encouraged by that. But here's the situation, and I want to, it's not on the screen, but I want to flip your Bibles over to Luke chapter 21, just for a second. Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 10, then he continued by saying to them, so the rest of this is Jesus talking, nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Before, But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you and deliver you from the synagogues and prisoners, bring you before kings and governors for my name's sake. In other words, what Jesus is saying, it's, you know, as you are a Christian, living a Christian life, not every day is going to be easy. And we're going to see that in the Apostle Paul's life. Certainly every day was not easy for him. He'll have challenges. But I want you to look at the very next verse. It's a short verse, verse 13. It says, it will, it will lead you to an opportunity for your testimony. I find that interesting because when we think about it, well, we can react to life in a couple different ways, can't we? And we know the familiar adage that advises when Life hands you lemonades, what? 
make when why fans you lemons make lemonade. And I'm a big component of lemonade. Actually, I was drinking lemonade right before church. Uh, it's one of my favorite drinks. I'm not allowed to drink soda anymore, so that's what I usually drink is lemonade with artificial sweetener in it. Be that as it may, but you know, when we think about this, what are we going to do about the things in life? And so this illustration is vivid. Lemon juice by itself is what? Sour. If we were to hand out lemons tonight, we cut them in, in, in quarters here, suck on this lemon, and we put it in our mouth, and oh, that's what? Sour. And that's just, uh, you know, some people wouldn't like that, and that's kind of horrible taste, if you will. But we take a little sugar, or in my case, artificial sweetener, and we put it in there, and, and we put some, mix some water with it. What do we have? We have a great refreshing drink. Well, life is a little bit like that, isn't it? The analogy is appropriate. Life sometimes hands us lemons. Life is sometimes disastrous. And, and circumstances are sometimes beyond our control. When that happens, one can merely try to endure the situation or try to find the good in that situation and make lemons into lemonade. Now, Paul... Although he would not have known or heard that adage, he believed in the philosophy behind this. Paul believed in the philosophy behind it. Since becoming a Christian, he was handed a wagon full of lemons, if you will. Well, I don't think his life before becoming a Christian was all that wonderful, but certainly as a Christian, he was handed all these things. And we look at the verses like 2 Corinthians, beginning at uh, chapter 11, beginning at verse 23, and shows us some of the things that he endured as a Christian. It says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I'm I so I more so in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. And so then he's going to give some of the things that actually happened. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. So that's those are the lashes where, where you pretty much bend over a little bit, and they just beat your back with these, these straps. And the reason they do it 39 times is because you're allowed to do it 40, but if you do it 41, you're breaking the law, and you will be punished. So they didn't want to miscount, so they always did it 39 times. Three times he was beaten with rods. He said, once I, I was stoned three times. I was shipwrecked a night and day I've spent in the deep, I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship, though many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst often, without food and cold and exposed. Wow, I don't think anybody here could say that we've, we've been through all these things. Now, some of us have had some difficult times, but I don't think that we could find a person that have been through all the things that the Apostle Paul went through. But I want you to notice verse 28, apart from such uh, external things, there is a daily pressure on me of concerning for all the churches. So what are you saying, Paul? Well, you're being beaten. What are you thinking about? You're thinking about the church? While you're shipwrecked and, and you don't know if you're going to live through the night, are, are you thinking about the church? Well, when you're going through all these difficulties and, and all these dangerous situations that you're in from the rivers, from the robbers, from your countrymen, and from, you know, all these, are you thinking about the church? That's exactly what Paul was thinking about. Now, Paul wanted to visit Rome as a preacher. But we see in Romans chapter 1 and verses 10 through 11, always in my prayers, make the request. And perhaps now at the last, by the will of God, I might succeed in coming to you. So he always wanted to come to Rome in the motion of a preacher, if you will, being a preacher. For I long to see you. I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gifts to you that you may be established. Well, this is when, when the church at Rome is, is just really kind of getting going, really starting out, and, and he wanted to do that. But now we see him in Rome, not as a preacher, for se, but as a prisoner. And we come to that verse that we start with. Now, I want you to know, brethren, 
So who is he talking to here? He's talking to brethren. This verse begins the body of Paul's entire letter to the Philippians. So basically everything before this point, before verse 12, is, is kind of setting things up for the body of the letter that he's going to write. Now he began with, I want you to know, brethren, Paul liked the words brother. I like that word, brother and sister. When we go to the policy of the pulpit, hopefully it's still on hold because of COVID, but hopefully it will be happening in August. When we go to policy of the pulpit, there's somewhere between five and 7,000 brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and some of them I've known for many, many years. And I'll go, like Brother Archie, I'll go, Brother Archie, and call him that. And he calls me Brother Elvis and, and different things. Why? Because we're the same family. We're in the family of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Another word for that is certainly brethren. Brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and, and so Paul is talking to 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 people with a special relationship to him, other Christians. It indicates a, a family relationship. And his mind was not focused on the problems that, that he had faced or was facing at that time, but on the progress, for the greater progress of the gospel. So here's the, the event that we can get out of what Paul is saying to us here. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ, and whatever we have gone through or are going through, here's our focus. And he's going to show us a couple ways on how that focus can go out, if you will, in just about any circumstance, even though it may not be an ideal circumstance. And so remember, the gospel of Jesus Christ is Paul's focus here. And so he's looking at this from that angle. When the apostles spoke about the advancements of the good news, he used uh, these particular words, Paul's in prison was clearing the way for the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. So we look at verse 13, we have so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole uh, Patreon guard and, and everyone else. It was no secret that Paul had been imprisoned. It was no secret where he was. Paul gave, was going to give us two examples of the progress of the gospel that made because of his imprisonment. Now, the first example is contact. Contact. Contact with the loss. So you see Paul in prison. He's going to have contact with the loss. Now, you say, well, who's going to see Paul in prison? Who, who's that? Who, you know, who are, who's going to visit? Paul had experienced remarkable evangelistic opportunities since his arrest in Jerusalem. We wouldn't think of that, would we? We would kind of be a little bit of the opposite of that. We'd think, okay, I've been arrested for uh, preaching the gospel, if that's the case. Okay? Now, I, I want to get out of jail. Mark and Mark and, and Ed better get some money together and come down and bail me out of jail. I hope that's the case. And so we may not think of, of the opportunity that that gives us, but what a great opportunity that does give us. I hope that, that, that before they collect some money, they bring me some supplies. Does that sound like the Apostle Paul? Well, he writes young Timothy and says, what, bring me what? My parchment, bring these different, you know, bring me my coats, winter time's coming, bring me some supplies. Well, the supplies they can give me is something like back to the Bible and make sure I have my Bible with me because that's going to allow me, not that I won't ever want to go to jail, but that would allow me some opportunity that I normally would not have. As, as someone who has visited prisons, it's hard for someone like me to get into a prison. Now, they allow sometimes for ministers, not during COVID, but under normal time they allow, but they put you through all kinds of things to get into maximum minimum security prisons to visit prisoners and talk to them about spiritual things. And then once you get in, you have to do what? Build up trust with the people you're talking to. And that's another thing. Now, if you're in there as a prisoner, guess what? That trust is a little bit easier to build up. So he has this opportunity. So we have to think of if something bad comes our way, maybe the COVID virus or, or whatever it is, how can we Find the opportunity to connect that to find contacts with lost people. And so certainly there are ways that we can do that. Now thinking about the Apostle Paul back to him, Acts 24, verse 24, verse 25, say some days later Felix arrived with Aurelius, his wife, who was a Jewish, 
and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. So what, what is Paul speaking about? He's speaking about faith in Christ. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, there's three subjects that, that Paul seems to think are important for him to talk about. Felix became frightened and said, go away from the present, and I will find time. Uh, when I find time, I will summon you. So we see here, you know, he's talking about Jesus Christ in, in these three different ways. However, none of these opportunities was more rewarding that afforded Paul when he was chained to soldiers in Rome. Acts 28 verse 16 says, when he entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. So they were, there was a one-in-one -one relationship, if you will. And so the, the, what a better time, you know, I'm sure you're talking about small stuff at first, and how's the weather, you know, how's the weather, the weather's great, you know, how's the, uh, the, the Roman football team, they had one, how's the Roman lacrosse team, you know, and, and pretty soon you're getting into religious things, I imagine, because it's the Apostle Paul, so he's not going to spend too much time on small talk. And after speaking, of the great progress of the gospel, he said that my imprisonment in the case of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Patriot Guard. Well, the King James would say it's the emperor's palace. And I think that's actually a better version of it because you get that view with the emperor's palace. And so 10,000 hand-picked Italian troops all of whom had rank on a level with a centurion and an officer who was over 100 soldiers. And so these are, are the ones who would be around this emperor's palace, these high military officials that you would see. And among their duties, they were uh, the emperor's private bodyguards. They, they had influence in Rome and, and later become the emperor makers of the Roman Empire. They had special privileges, including double pay and their own quarters in Rome. When they retired after 12 to 16 years, they were given Roman citizenship and a liberal grant. And the fact that Paul was turned over to this regiment was and was guarded by them may indicate the importance given to his case by the Roman official. But remember, we studied this a little bit, how he was arrested and, and things like that, and how he ended up in Rome before. Now, in guarding Paul, the standard practice was for shifts every six hours. So if you were on that shift, you would, you would guard Paul for six hours, and then, you know, another person would come on, and then, you know, so you would have four shifts during the night. And, and so how many people could Paul really, or I'm sorry, four shifts during a 24-hour period. So how many people could Paul really um, have opportunities with? Well, at least four. Now, they may have been the same four every single day, or they may have been, you know, I, I imagine they were probably different during different days. And so he had many opportunities uh, with these people. Now, with this schedule, the apostles had opportunity to influence these soldiers. The soldiers, no doubt, thought of Paul as the captive, but it was he who had a captive audience. Have you ever thought about that? And can the guard leave? Absolutely not. So he has a captive audience for six hours. For a preacher, that's kind of like a dream. You know, somebody locked the door and said, you're here for six hours, you know, we're going to be here for a little bit, I think. You know, and so he has that opportunity with them for six hours. Um, now, as he went through his busy day, he had several things. As he dictated letters, such as the one to the Philippians, so we can kind of see uh, a little bit what he did. He dictated different letters, and we saw that picture, and that was kind of, I go back to that, oh, that's not the one. I'm going the wrong way, sorry. There we go. Kind of, you see the, the uh, secretaries, we all outside Paul's cell taking, taking notes. And many times, maybe it may, may have been the guard that would take notes because Paul wrote three letters that we know of from the prison cell. And, and so he would dictate those and, and uh, people would write them and, and then Paul would sign with his own hand as the letters would say. Well, he also talked with friends such as Timothy and Ephroditus. He also taught those who came to see him. 
He was allowed certain visitors, and so he would talk, talk them. He prayed and praised God. Remember when, when uh, others were in prison um, in the book of Acts, and, and you hear them praising God and praying in the cell? As he and finally, he uh, talked with his captors and answered their questions. So here's the question. Did any of these soldiers become Christians? You say, well, he had a captive audience. Did they become Christians? And that's really the answer. According to uninspired tradition, some of them did. And they had learned that it was not in prison, that he was not in prison because of a crime, but because of his faith in Jesus. Philippians chapter 4. Get back to that. Well, not all messed up. Can you go to 422? Philippians 422. Maybe? Yeah, just. Okay. Philippians 422. It says, all the saints greet you, especially those. Sorry, I shouldn't have gone back and I said that. There, I got it. Not there. Um, All right, lost a bunch of slides. Anyway, yeah. Philippians 4.22, and the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's house. Um, we see in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 9, for which I suffer hardship even to the imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not in prison. Um, so we see him in prison and he's trying to make the best of that situation. Secondly, his bonds helped the gospel progress. We see that in, in First Philippians 1 14. Do I have that? Inside the back. There it is. Okay. And that the most of the brethren trusted in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. And so we see this, you know, encouragement, if you will. And so the second point is the example of how his bonds help to progress the gospel. And we have to think again, well, why would distress or something you know, that's not good. If we're making, you know, we got these, you know, we're, we're dealt with a bunch of bad news and horrible situations and, and all this help to progress the gospel. There's a church that I know of, and I won't mention any names, but there's a church that I know of that was a very evangelistic church. But over the years, they kind of, well, got set in their ways and their evangelism efforts just kind of fell flat. And their attendance began to, it's not this church, I'm just, begin to fall flat. And, and they didn't have any evangelism. And, 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 you know, it came to the point where it's questionable what was going to happen to that particular church. Would that church survive? Would they just kind of die out? What would happen to that church? And, and they kind of looked around and they in particular looked at the preacher and said, Preacher, what are you going to do? And the preacher said, Well, I need your help too. I can't just do this all by myself. And so they said, Well, no, no. Preacher, you, you need to do it by yourself. The preacher says, Well, I can't do that. Well, long story short, the preacher ended up leaving. And the attendance dropped even more. And finally, someday they just, you know, when they saw basically the end was in sight, they kind of woke up. They said, wow, we've got to go out and, and do something. Because the preacher's gone. And he, he'd been gone for a year at this point. And, and they just had to wake up and do something. And, and, and they got together and said, well, what made us what we were in the first place. What did we do in the first place? Well, we went out and we talked to people. We invited people to church. We looked for opportunities for evangelistic effort. We, you know, and so when that happened, the church began to go up and up and up, and, and, and church is, is alive and, and in very good shape right now. Well, why does that happen? Because something bad kind of had to happen to them before they kind of woke up. 
You know, when situations happen, it, it, it's, you know, you have to look at the situation and say, well, this is happening. It's not idea. It's not great. But, you know, what can we make good out of this situation? I remember we had a BBS here from Arnold who came several years ago. And, um, we had a wonderful VBS with Arnold. And one of the nights was near the end. The boys were driving home. And I got a panic phone call. We have hit a car. Some of you might remember that. It had, we had that red vibe. It used to be my car. And then I gave it to them. And, and uh, we hit a car. And, you know, what had happened? Or what had happened is a trailer had gone off from the road unattached to anything. And they were coming along on a dark road. And they'd see the trailer. It hit the trailer. And it pushed them off the road. And it, it totaled their car and everything. Of course, I get the call. I'm doing, you know, quick speeds to get to them and make sure they're okay and everything like that. And, and so we, we look at the situation as, well, what can we do to make this situation all right? We have a car that is no longer drivable. We have a situation where we need a car. And guess what? Someone from the church at that time stepped up and said, hey, we've got a car that we would sell you for whatever you, the insurance company settles for on your car. And it was several thousand dollars less than that car it was booked at. And so sure enough, we, we, we got it from them. And we still, Zach still drives that car today. And, you know, what can you make in a situation that's bad? And so certainly what they found out when, when Paul was arrested, it really encouraged other preachers. It really did. It, it it gave them courage when they saw how Paul trusted in the Lord to take care of him. It, it increased their confidence in God. When they saw the apostles' assurance in spite of troubles, and maybe this gave them courage to, to face whatever ridicule that they might face as preachers. Now, this Greek word for preach here is to herald and applies public proclamation. And this word here is used ordinary term to speak or commentators have suggested that the emphasis was not on a public proclamation of the word, but on day-to-day -day sharing of the gospel by every Christian. That's the best result, isn't it? Not necessarily when the preacher gets up and preaches, although hopefully that's helpful, but the best results is when everyone shares the gospel, is able to study and open the Bible with others. Mark 16 and verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and, and preach the gospel to, to all creatures. There, there's the, the command by Jesus. In, in another command by Jesus we see in Matthew 28, the verse 18 or verse 19 through 20. Um, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. This, this verse is kind of simple. You break it down and, and, and it's go, teach, go, baptize, and teach. Go and baptize and teach. So we see that there, and that's our command for us to do and share the good news of the gospel. A man by the name in the old, in the old days by the name of Celius, he was an early critic of Christianity. He wrote that leather dressers, those are people who work with leather, wool workers, cobblers, the most illiterate and vulgar of mankind are zealous preachers for the gospel. He meant this as a criticism for them. But really, it was high praise when you think about it because the counter of the merchant, the desk of the tax collector, the plow handle of the farmer were their pulpits. Paul's imprisonment gave Christians such of these courage Courage to share the gospel, courage, courage to preach the gospel. When, when he starts beginning to get into the body of his letter, he leaves us a couple things. 
really look for those opportunities to connect. And when you find those, no matter what situation you're in, you can further the gospel of Christ. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, we encourage you to do so. We hope that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and, and that you have repented of your sins. If not, you can certainly do that. That's a prayer between you and God. You just declare that, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's your confession. Live a life like that, that you do believe it. And, and Acts chapter 2, and verse 38, 2 Peter 3, and 16, and others. Tell us that when we're baptized, our sins are forgiven. Baptized for forgiveness of our sins. If you'd like to do that tonight, we'll help you with that. Maybe you just need prayers or encouragement. We'll help you as we come, as we stand, and as we sing. As an affection's been nailed to the cross, is a heart right with God. Does thou count things for Jesus but Since the broken body on the cross, we pray that you'll bless those that need it and will partake of it. We pray that you'll forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let's give thanks to the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we come today in prayer. Again, we pray that you will bless this cup as it represents the blood. We pray that you will let us remember what these emblems mean and what they should represent to us. We pray that you will forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Dear 
This concludes the Lord's Supper. There's baskets back on the back table for the offering. If you can't do so, you can do it as you leave or however you choose to do it. Uh, does anybody have any announcements before we have a closing prayer? If not, we'll have a prayer and be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to in prayer. We pray that you will be with the church, me too, that we feel I'm doing what's right in thy sight. We pray that you will let us all become stronger Christians than what we have been in the past. We pray that you will let us be a shining light to those around us, that we can hopefully gain souls and bring them to that goal. We pray that you will be with the sick, that you will give them the care that they need, that they can back and more show up with again once more. We pray that you will be with us throughout the week. We pray that you will forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we do pray.